invite you to turn to John chapter 6 in your Bibles. John chapter 6. And you may notice that I'm turning you to the New Testament, not to the Old Testament, because we've been talking about manna for a long time now, um, and uh, six weeks actually. And most of that has been coming from the Old Testament, you know, Exodus and Deuteronomy, some of the, the stories, that's where manna takes place. And how many of you are tired of manna? You're like, I, I had enough of this. I can't hear. I know my father-in-law has. He said, enough manna, seriously. Now, let me just tell you, they have it 40 years. They had six weeks, you know, suck it up. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's imagine what that was like, 40 years of just one after another after another. Just every day all we see is this stinking manna. We've talked about that, right? That's what, that was their attitude because it was like, I'm tired of this. You know, all you're doing is hearing about it. You get to go home and eat whatever you want. They had to eat it day after day after day after day. What are we having today? Same thing we had yesterday, right? You know, how you want to prepare it a little bit? You know, I don't know. You got manna smoothies? Can we make a smoothie out of that, you know? Um, we've, we've discovered all sorts of things. You know, Nikki started us off and talked about how manna, the provision, manna is, if you don't know, it's the provision of God, the miraculous provision of God in the story of, of Israel throughout history. Um, you can go back and listen to some other messages or just read the story. It's in the book um, if you'd like to, to check that out. But man, is this miraculous provision of God and that sometimes in our lives, God provides in ways we don't expect. Like you think God's, you, you think you need this and God provides, it just doesn't look like you thought it was going to look. And then whatever you have need for, we found that God, that there's, there's manna for that. That God says, I've got it for you. But then we've learned that manna only kind of shows up one day at a time. Right? So there's new manna for that every day. Yesterday's manna is, is over. It's done. It's rotten. You need new manna today. Right? And we, we just continue to explore and kind of take it apart and say, what is all that? That manna includes rest. Right? That God says, hey, one day out of every week, there's no manna on the ground. And that's a good thing. So I don't need you to work constantly. I've got you. Built into this is just trust me. Just trust me. Because Manna isn't necessarily just about the manna, right? It's about what God is, what he's doing in us. And that sometimes God is actually going to provide in ways that are manna. That there came a point in time in Israel's history where there was no more manna, right? That says the manna stopped and they never saw it again and we've never seen it again. Kevin was complaining, like, that's probably not what manna looks like. Because we don't know what manna looks like. That's coriander. It says it looked kind of like coriander. It tasted kind of like coriander. It looked like white flakes. We were saying it, I don't know if I, we should say what we, what we said before, but it's... It was flaky stuff on the ground, like you can imagine. I don't know what that looks like. We don't know. The point is that God has always been providing, and it's, it's something about what he's doing in us, that preparing us for all the ways, however God provides for us, whether it's miraculous or whether it's very natural, whether it looked like you going to work, getting a paycheck, and it doesn't look like anything miraculous of God. Guess what? That's still manna. That's still the provision of God. Right? And, and so we've talked about all that. So we've explored all this stuff. Now we're going to jump forward to the time of Jesus, and last week, if you were with us, we had Pastor Ray Tate here, and he did a fantastic job preaching and just sharing about this. I did not ask him to preach about manna. Um, I just told him he'd preach whatever he wanted, and he decided to preach about manna a little bit. Um, and so uh, he actually read what I was going to preach on today a little bit. So he stepped on my toes just a little bit, but not bad, actually enough to kind of set us up just perfectly. Um, and he talked about Jesus, and we're going to read this. If you remember the story, I'll set it up. Jesus had just preached in front of like thousands of people, similar to today. Thousands of people here, right? Like just the hillsides were filled with people. And then at some point, the people got hungry. He was preaching for a while and like it, it'll happen like in maybe 18 minutes, right? Collectively, your stomachs will start to go, even if you've had bagels, it doesn't matter. You'll just start to, you'll just start to get like it's just, I understand it's the rhythm of life. And the, you start to get hungry. Well, the people started to get hungry. And there's thousands of people, and there was no food courts, and they did not do DoorDash or anything like that back then. There was no delivery, you know, by pigeon. I don't know if they drop, you know, some fish to you or something like that. There was nothing like that. So there's all these people. They're very hungry. They've been listening to Jesus. And uh, so Jesus, he says, hey, you know what? Uh, what do we have to feed the people with? All they have is five loaves of bread and two fish. Uh, two fish, so it's not a lot of people, right? There's this thing, uh, what do you do with that? And so you know the miracle, Jesus multiplies the food, and it says they fed 
over 5,000 pe people. That's just the men. And so there's also women and children. So, I mean, we're talking thousands of people. He feeds them all. It says, and there were, there were 12 disciples kind of doing this, handing it out. It says there were 12 basketfuls left over, one for each disciple. It's kind of cool how that works out. It's this amazing miracle. Everybody's buzzing about it. It's awesome. It's great. This was like, imagine experiencing that. Like, you're eating this miracle food. You know, this is now, remember, these are Jewish people, right? So they had grown up into the history of, of Israel. They knew the stories of manna. They knew about all that stuff. They're just here, and now they're getting, like, miracle food again. Now, it's fish and bread, but it's still miraculous. Like, they don't know where this food is coming from. Like, how is there food for all this? How do they keep just passing food out? Like, where is this coming from? And so we're going to, and so it's, it's absolutely amazing. So it, it's a great day. They all go home. The next day, the people come back looking for Jesus, right? And uh, he was now had moved to the other side of a lake. This was a huge lake that they were on. I mean, large, like, you know, miles across. And he is now taken, he's on the other side of the lake. And they go looking for him. So we're going to pick up the story there. John chapter 6, verse 25. And this is what we read. It says, they found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? And as Pastor Ray pointed out last week, they couldn't have cared less when he got there. That was not actually on their minds at all. They had other things on their mind. It's like when somebody asks you, hey, how you doing? You're walking by them and they go, hey, how you doing? Like I'm walking around the lake, they go, hey, how you doing? Yeah, I'm not asking you. I'm not, a I'm not waiting for an answer, right? I'm not like, Rabbi, when did you get here? They're not asking. Not asking, okay, at all. When did you get here? They have other things on their mind. It's just a pleasantry. And Jesus replies, I tell you the truth, he says. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. That's what he says. You don't want to be with me because I fed you, but you didn't understand. Listen, Jesus is so New Jersey. I love it. I love it, right? Here's what he says. He's no beating around the bush. Let's just get right to it. Let's shoot straight. We all know the only reason you're here is you're hungry and you want more food. That's it. You are not here because you're, you're here to listen, to learn. You're not, you're not here to, to worship. You're not here to figure out, you know, how I'm doing. You don't even know who I really am, right? All they know is that yesterday, this guy gave us free food, and I want some more of that. I just don't feel like paying. Like, free food? Hey, sign me up. Like, they could have food. They could go home and get food. But they just were like, you know, hey, this guy's handing out food. Let's see if he does it again. That's it. Literally it. And Jesus is like, hey. Don't, let's not play games. This is what you want, right? So he continues. Don't be so concerned. Verse 27. He says, don't be, here we go, so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me his seal of approval. He's basically telling them, you are thinking way too small. That's what he's saying. You're thinking too small. Stop spending so much time thinking about food. There are more important things to think about. Some of you in your house, there are people who live there who only think about food. Do you, don't, you don't have to look, but you know that all they think about is food. And once they've eaten, the next thing on their mind is, what am I going to eat next? And then, when, when am I, okay, what, what, what about next? Like, it's just food. We, we just ate. Yeah, but, like, I'm, but what's next? Like, we just had breakfast, why are you asking for lunch? We just had lunch, why are you asking for dinner? We just had dinner, why are you asking about dessert or snacks? Or the, it's constantly food. And Jesus says, stop spending so much time thinking about food. There's more important things. He says, listen, take all that energy that you are putting into thinking about food, food, right? Think about, take that energy, remember. And he says, listen, remember, they had literally crossed a lake trying to find Jesus just because they're trying to find where more food is. They're putting energy into this. They're hunting for Jesus. They didn't know where he was. There's no, you know, GPS. There's no Twitter. You know, hey, Jesus is over this side. Like, they're, they're, they're just searching. He says, take all that energy you're putting into finding food, right? And instead, put that energy into seeking eternal life. Now, let me tell you, sometimes we read the Bible, or as we listen to a message, you know, or something like that. We're engaged and interested, and then we read or hear something that sounds super spiritual, we're like, oh, that's so spiritual that it's almost irrelevant. 
Like, it's so grand and mystical that we have no framework for it. It's lofty, it's detached from the real world, and we just ignore it and move on. And we go, you know, I don't know what you mean, and rather than figuring it out, I'm just going to kind of, like, move on. I don't have the energy or interest to figure out what that actually means. Now, I know you don't do that, but there are some people that occasionally, and I think this is one of those moments Spend your energy seeking the eternal life the Son of Man can give you. Oh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what that means. No idea. What? Spend my energy seeking the eternal life. Yes, we should do that. Okay, um, so listen to what the people say next, right? Because this is exactly what happened to them. Super spiritual, super like ethereal. Verse 28, this is what they say. Uh, we want to perform God's works. What, what, what should we do? Like, they, what? Like, they didn't listen at all to what Jesus just said. Didn't he just tell them? He literally just told them what to do. He literally just said, stop spending your energy here, start spending your energy there. And they go, okay, yeah, well, what should we do? Because they don't get it. It doesn't make any sense in their heads. It's so grand. And Jesus is patient. And so he... Says it again a little louder for those in the back. Verse 29, he tells them, okay, this is the only work God wants you from you. Believe in the one he has sent. And I imagine them all going like this. Uh, you know why they don't understand? They're like, they're like blank. You know why they're blank? Because their minds are going, I just want food. I just want food. Did he say anything about food? Did you hear anything food? I don't hear food. Where's the food, right? So can you guess what comes next? Here we go, verse 30. Jesus says, this is all I want, believe. And they go like this, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. So now they bring manna into it, right? And they ask Jesus, well, what can you do? Listen, the people simply want food and are trying to trick Jesus. They're literally trying to trick Jesus into just giving him food. They don't, they don't want to do God's work. They don't want to do any of this stuff. They don't want to, they're just trying to say, okay, how do we get this guy to give us food? What if we, so how about we compare him to Moses, right? I just want a sandwich. Can this guy just, can this guy just give me food? See, the people are Jewish. They would have held Moses in high esteem. Jesus, they don't know who this guy is. They're, they're just learning who this guy is. They don't have the same. But Moses is up here. Jesus is down there as far as they're concerned. So they're almost saying, you know, hey, Jesus, how about let's challenge you. You think you're like, you think you want to be something in our lives. Well, this is what Moses did. What, what can you do for me? Moses gave them food. And Jesus is ready for this challenge. He says in verse 32, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, <laughs> give us that bread every day, right? That's what we, right? oh man, this conversation mirrors a conversation Jesus had with the, with the woman at the well. If you know that story, there was a woman um, there and she was there in the middle of the day getting some water, right? And the people are talking about one kind of bread. And in her case, she was talking about one kind of water. And Jesus says, I got living water for you that you know nothing about. And she goes, give me some of that, right? And he says, I got bread for you. And they go, give me some of that, right? And they're talking about this thing. And he's talking about this thing out here. You know, I just want water. I got living water. I'll take some of that. They don't understand. I just want bread. I got living bread. I'll just give me some of that. They don't understand. It's, it's a mirror. This happened to him all the time. Jesus would be talking about one thing, and people would be talking about something else, and they think they're talking about what he's talking about, and he's not. He's like 10 layers ahead of them. They're just not getting it. I can almost hear Jesus sigh in this moment, right, and take a deep breath, and maybe even talk a little slower. Like, you ever have that, like, with somebody, you're like, I don't, I don't know if you're getting this. Maybe if I say it slower, you'll understand me. I'm going to say the same thing again. So Jesus replies in verse 35. It says this. Verse 35 says, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. 
Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Skip down to verse 47. He says this, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. And listen, they all died. (laughs) But anyone who eats the bread from heaven will never die. Verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Just like manna came down from heaven to you and provided for you, I came down from heaven to you. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? I'm trying to say it really simple for you. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever, and this bread which I will offer so the world may live is my flesh. And let me tell you, a lot of people continued to not get it. You can read the story, and it says many people walked away from Jesus at this point because they go, I don't get this. It doesn't make any sense. I don't understand what he's talking about. He's talking about cannibalism? Like, what is going on here? What, I, here's the thing what we need to know, right? Here's just a few thoughts about this. The people just wanted food. The people just want food. I don't care about anything else. If They would have been very happy if Jesus was like, fine, here's some food. They would have been very, very happy. If he had waved his hand and made food ha- appear, they'd have been thrilled. They'd have said, this guy, Jesus, is awesome, and they would have went away. And what would have happened the next day? They would go looking for him again. They would continue to look for him. And then the next day, and the next day, they keep coming back over and over again looking for food. At the forefront of their minds was what? What are they thinking about? They're thinking about their appetites. They're thinking about what they need, their physical body. And here's the thing. When they looked at Jesus, all they saw was a vending machine. He was just free food. That's all he was to them. They only saw provision for today. But here's the truth. Jesus has so much more to offer than just manna. He has so much more to offer than just daily provision. Manna is good. We need it. God is good. He gives it, right? Even if we despise it, God says, hey, listen, you despise this stuff. I'm giving it to you anyway. It's called grace. The people complain. I hate this stinking manna. It's awful. It's terrible. I'm so tired of this. God gives it anyway. Manna is good. We need it. God gives it. It tells us so much about him that he continues to give that to us. But God has so much more than just daily provision for us. Just as our body hungers for food, And maybe right now you're starting to get there. If you haven't had breakfast yet, you're starting to feel a little bit. Our body has these physical appetites. In that same way, our souls have appetites. Our spirits have appetites. We hunger for things like love and acceptance, for for validation, for affirmation, for meaning and significance. I want to know that what I'm doing matters. We know that I'm seen, that I'm respected. We hunger for peace, for purpose. Deep inside us are these longings, these soul appetites. And we can try to satisfy those appetites in so many different ways. Think about it. If you're having a bad day, maybe you're feeling discouraged, like your work wasn't recognized, you've been working really hard, nobody noticed. Or maybe you've been working on something and it didn't really, it didn't happen. It was a very frustrating day. Or maybe you just weren't acknowledged. You, you felt like nobody loved you today. Nobody cared. But you were having a bad day and nobody asked. You're just feeling like unnoticed, unseen, invisible. You, know, you have these bad days. And how many of us on those bad days, our solution is a bucket of ice cream. What do we do? We eat our emotions right? I'm just going to eat my emotion. And let me tell you, does it work? Absolutely. For a day. Works for a day. But the next day, guess what? It comes back. It comes back. You can keep getting buckets, but it only works for a little bit. And what are we doing there? What are we doing? What we're doing is we're trying to satisfy soul and spirit appetites with body provision. If your marriage is going through a rough time, 
you may look for something else to make up for it. You may be having conflict here, and so you'll work a little harder. Or you may go shopping, or go play golf, or go fishing, or do something like that. Because what are you trying to do? We're trying to meet this need, this deficit, this appetite with something else. And it works for a minute. We're trying to make temporary provisions satisfy soul needs. And here's the problem. Jesus tells us very clearly, that's not what manna is for. That's not what his provision is for. He's not giving us that stuff. Manna is for today. It's God's provision for today. It's good. It's what we need for each day. It's great for our body, for our existence. It's good. It's amazing. But manna is nothing compared to Jesus. It says, you, they had manna in the desert. Yeah, guess what? I'm the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. The provision of God is nothing compared to the person of God. Say that again. The provision of God is nothing compared to the person of God. It's so easy for us to spend so much of our time looking for God to give us what we need when he really wants us to have who we need. We get so focused on the provision. The point of manna was not simply for God to provide for the people. It does that. It certainly provides for our needs. And it's so tempting to become so focused on the provision of God because it comes from Him and it is good. And we become like the people. Hey, Jesus, I just want food. I don't care about you. I just want food. I don't understand all that other stuff. I just want food. Keep giving me my manna for today. That's, and we become consumed with it. The purpose of manna was to lead them to the purpose behind it, the person behind it. Manna is life-giving for today. Jesus is life-giving forever. Manna is food for our body. The bread of life is food for our soul. It's literally soul food. It's soul food. We all have appetites in our souls, but we can pretend like we don't. You can pretend like, no, I'm good. I don't have any of those soul appetites. Or they're all matter. I'm happy. I'm good. I'm fine. You know who we are? We're Michael Scott. Do I need to be liked? Absolutely not. I like to be liked. I enjoy being liked. I mean, I have to be liked, but it's not like this compulsive need to be liked, like my need to be praised. Right? <laughs> if you're an office fan, you'll appreciate it. But we can pretend like we don't have needs. Can I tell you, unmet appetites in our soul steal life from us. You can pretend like you don't have any of those deep needs. You can pretend like you're fine, but those unmet appetites in our soul, they steal life from us. Because that need cries out for fulfillment. If your need for approval is not satisfied, it's going to be evident. Have you ever been around somebody who you know they don't have enough approval? You've been around people that they're constantly looking for validation. They're looking to you for it. They're looking to other people. You know what I'm talking about. Have you ever been around somebody who's got some soul need? We was around somebody once. They called them EGRs. Extra grace required. You're around somebody, and it just seems like they suck the life out of you. They're just needy people. You know what that is? It's an unmet soul appetite that is stealing life from them and is trying to suck it away from you. It cries out for fulfillment. And here's the great danger of our soul appetites. We have them. We can say, no, I don't have them. I mean, I don't need it. I like it. I want it. I have to have it, but I don't need it. We can say those things, but the reality is it cries out for fulfillment. And the great danger is that we will look to others to meet those deep soul needs in us, and it's impossible for them to ever do it. It's impossible for someone else to meet your deepest need. No praise from a boss at any level can validate your work. 
can make your work meaningful. No approval from a spouse or a parent is enough to meet that appetite. You will always wonder, listen, brother, Grandpa Paprosky in our family, miss him? Every time after I, he used to come to our church, every, you know, when he, every time after I preached, he'd walk up and he'd go, Billy Graham couldn't have done better. Listen, it was awesome, so encouraging. He's a little bit biased. My mom tells me things. Hey, you're doing a great job. I'm like, thanks, mom. You're biased. I can't. There's no amount of approval from anybody else that will actually sink into because we'll always go, I wonder if they're right. Are they just saying that? Do they mean that? What if they're wrong? There's not enough approval or validation from anybody else to meet those deep needs. You may be aware of them, maybe not. It doesn't change that they're there. I have them, you do too. We were made that way. There's something inside us, and it's not bad. We want to say, I don't want to be needy. I don't want to be that person that just you know, has needs all the time. I don't want to be the person that's always craving attention or validation or love or peace or significance. I don't want to be that person. The problem is we're wired that way. We were designed that way. You cannot eliminate that. You can't just ignore it, put it there, because it's always going to cry out. It's an appetite. You will find all sorts of other things to try and satisfy it and throw at it, but it will never be enough. You can't eat enough ice cream. Here's the point. God made us that way because he has the bread that satisfies that hunger. If we're not looking to him for it, it will never be satisfied. We live in a world of people starving. Starving, and they don't need manna. They don't need the daily provision of God because it's not enough. It's a grace, it's a gift, we get it, it's good, but tomorrow I need more and the day after and I can't keep coming back for this because Jesus says, I got so much more for you. Here comes the good news. Jesus says, I am greater than manna, I am the living bread, I am the bread of life. As you enter and walk through life in relationship with me, guess what happens? Those deep needs get met. Life starts to fill your heart, your soul, your mind, your being as you are walking in relationship with Jesus, which is why the world needs him. He begins to satisfy those things that perhaps they have been trying to satisfy with everything else. Relationship after relationship, but they never feel loved enough. Job after job, and it never feels like purpose enough. Accomplishment after accomplishment, but they never feel like they're worthy. These hungers and appetites in us that can only be met by the bread of life. Nothing else. You and I are not simply made to get through this life. Because if we were, daily provision would be enough. If the goal was to get through this life, that daily provision, we'd feel totally at peace. I would have no needs. But the fact that I have this longing inside me for something more. I was listening. If you haven't seen a clip, I was thinking about showing it today. I'm not, I didn't show it. But there's a clip from the, uh, the, this most recent college world uh, series of softball for girls. And uh, the, the Oklahoma team, I think they're like this incredible team, Oklahoma girls softball, Oklahoma University. It's, it's absolutely, I mean, they, they were like blowing everybody up. It was a great, and there's an interview. It's on ESPN of, of three, the team members and the coach. And they ask them, you know, it's been a grind. It's been a long season. How did you guys continue to keep the season joyful? How did you continue? And oh, my gosh. One after another after another was like, well, I'll just tell you, you know, it's Jesus. It's on ESPN. Well, what? It's Jesus. I said, you know, Joy, one girl said, we, I won championships before, and you know what? 
The next day, I didn't know what to do with myself. It's like, all right, now what? I had reached the pinnacle. It's like it's, 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 she said, the only way I have joy is because of my relationship with Jesus because no matter what happens, he's met that need. Because we have the hope of heaven Softball is just a game we get to play. We get to enjoy this and do this together. And this is all in perspective because those deep needs are met. Highly recommend you go home, Google it, and watch it. It's the best three and a half minutes. It's much better than my message. You will, you will. There's something deep inside us that acknowledges we were meant for more. C.S. Lewis said it perfectly. One of my favorite quotes, he says this. If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. These bodies, thankfully, are temporary. <laughs> How many of you are thankful for that? <laughs> They're all going to fade away along with all that manna. Right? It just fades away, just melts away. It disappears at the end of the day. It was never meant to be forever. But we are. Our souls are eternal. You are eternal. You are made for eternity. Let me say that again. You are eternal. Again, it was C.S. Lewis who said, you have never met a mere mortal. We're eternal beings. That means your soul has appetites that are eternal that can only be satisfied by the one who is eternal. If we're designed this way, it only makes sense that manna is not enough for that. That Jesus says, hey, manna, the wilderness, that was great, but guess what? They all died. I am the bread of life. And when you're in relationship with me, you will never die. We're at a concert uh, Friday night in South Jersey with a worship leader. It's great. Her name is Charity Gale. Highly recommend you check out her music. It's fantastic. That one song, uh, I Speak Jesus, if you know that song, I Speak Jesus, my family, all that stuff, she wrote that. It was great. But there's a line in one of her, in one of her songs that says, uh, death has been defeated and life has no end. It's like, Man, so good. So good. We are eternal. Jesus gives us life forever. So what? So what? I'll invite the band back up there. That's their cue. Jesus tells us so what. Here is what he says. Ready? Here's the so what. Here's the application. So what do we do with that? All right, we've got the idea, but what do we do with this? Here's the application. You ready? He told us, don't be so concerned about perishable things. Guess what, manna? It's going to come. We've been talking about it for weeks. You've probably seen it already in your life. Manna will be there. You can count on it. Promise of God. You will have what you need. There will be manna for that every single day. He does not fail. God is faithful. So, guard against letting concern for manna be all-consuming. Trust God for it, put it in his hands, and stop being so worried about where your daily needs are going to come from. He has it. He has it. Enough. We've talked about it. You get it. Done. Move on. Next, stop being so concerned about perishable things. But more importantly, ready? Spend your life. Spend your energy. Spend your, your days seeking the eternal life he wants to give to you. Come to Jesus with all your soul hunger. Bring it to him. Let me ask you, what hunger is stealing life from you? What hunger is stealing life from you? What are you chasing? What appetite in your soul are you trying to satisfy with earthly things? What do you keep trying to, to, to take? Keep running after and putting a lot of energy into it. Stop looking to anybody or anything else to satisfy the eternal appetite in your soul. Bring it all to Jesus. He promises you. Ready? 
whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Oh, man. How good is God? Spend your energy finding and discovering the eternal life God has for you. I don't think we think about eternity enough. We get so caught up in our everyday life. When was the last time you actually like spent time thinking about heaven? Like, really thinking about it. We get so caught up in this everyday life, which is why manna is so appealing. It feeds us for every day, and so we live there. That's why it's always on our mind. But heaven, Jesus says, hey, listen, don't forget. It's one of our core values, right? The best is yet to come. Let's not forget. This is not it. It's really not it. Again, it was C.S. Lewis, and I'll paraphrase here. He said, too many Christians spend so little time thinking about the next life and all their time thinking about this one. He says, and that's why so many Christians are ineffective in this life. Because they're so consumed with the here and now. Manna was just an introduction. God was just setting the stage for the bread of life. So I will give you bread. Again, Pastor Ray shared In the beginning, God says, I will give you food. And then throughout the history of Israel, God says, I will, I will give you food. I, will, I got you. But it's never been about the food. It's about the relationship. Know me. And it's not just for your provision for today, but it's provision forever. It's about the person. Whatever you need for eternity. And I just say, whatever, whatever soul appetite you perceive in yourself today, there's Jesus for that. There's bread of life for that. There's the living bread for that. Whatever you have need of daily, there's manna for that. But whatever you have in your soul, there's Jesus for that. Scarborough with ESPN, for, for the players, I know you talk about keeping the joy of the game, but I'm curious. It's a long season, right? And you guys have had the target on your back the entire time, the win streak being number one. How do you handle the unique pressure that comes with that? How do you keep the joy for so long when anxiety seems like a thing that could very easily set in? Well, the only way that you can have a joy that doesn't fade away is from the Lord. And any other type of joy is actually happiness that comes from circumstances and outcomes. And um, I think Coach has said this before, but joy from the Lord is really the only thing that can keep you motivated, um, uh, just in a good mindset, uh, no matter the outcomes. Thankfully, we've had a lot of success this year, but if it was the other way around, uh, joy from the Lord is the only thing that can keep you embracing those memories, moments, friendships, and all of that. So uh, I would, that's really the only, the only answer to that because there's no other way that softball can bring you that um, because of how much failure comes in it and just how much of a roller coaster the game can be. 1,000% agree with Grace Lyons. Um, I went through that my freshman year. I I was so happy to win the college. I've talked about this before, but I was just so happy that we won the College World Series, but I didn't feel joy. I didn't have I didn't know what to do the next day. I didn't know what to do for that following week. I didn't feel filled and I had to find Christ in that and I think that is what makes our team so strong is that we're not afraid to lose because if it's not the end of the world if we do lose. Yes, obviously we've worked our butts off to be here and we want to win, but it's not the end of the world because our life is in Christ and that's all that matters. Yeah, um, I think a huge thing that we've really just latched onto is eyes up. And you guys mm -hmm. see us doing this and pointing up, but we're really like fixing our eyes on Christ. And that's something where like they were saying, you can't find a fulfillment in an outcome, whether it's good or bad. And um, I think that's why we're so steady in what we do and, and our love for each other and our love for the game, because we know this game is giving us the opportunity to glorify God. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think once we figured that out and that was our purpose and everyone was all in with that, um, it's really changed so much for us. And I mean, I know myself, I, I've seen so much of a growth in myself with 
Um, once I turned to Jesus and I realized how he had changed my outlook on life, not just softball, but understanding how much I have to live for, and that's living to exemplify the kingdom. And I think that brings so much freedom. And I'm sure everyone's story is similar, but we all have those great testimonies that have really like shown how awesome it is to play for something bigger. Um, and I think that's just what brings me so much joy. And no matter the outcome, whether we get a trophy in the end or not, we're, this isn't our home. And I think that's what's amazing about it is we have so much more. We have an eternity of joy with our Father, and I'm so excited about that. And, yes, I live in the moment, but I know this isn't my home. And um, no matter what, my sisters in Christ will be there with me in the end um, when we're with our, our King. So.